So in this video, I just want to go over some areas of some basic surfaces. These were the surfaces that we were using as building blocks to come up with the more general version of how to find the area of a surface of revolution through integration. So this is the foundation. These are the building blocks. We don't use integration or anything to do with these ones. These we have to work out the surface areas using basic principles. They are probably things you've seen already before. But I just want to work them out for completeness. So you've seen them here and that now we can use them when we developed those more general integration formulas for surface area. So what are our basic surfaces? Well, there's the cylinder. Looks like this. And in all these cases, if there's an open end on it, we're, we're not imagining there's a disc on the end. So in this case, we're just interested in the lateral surface area, the sides here. So there's our cylinder, maybe base radius R, and height L. The next basic shape we want to consider is a cone. So it looks like this. And again, we'll say base radius R and side length, side length L. And we're interested in, again, the, the surface area of the sides here. And the last shape that I want to work out the surface area of is the frustum of a cone. And this you can think of as, imagine taking a whole cone and just lopping off the top of it, so cutting off the top of it. So I'm going to cut off the top, but I'll dot it in just so we can see that this is really part of a bigger object. And here we'll say we've got a base radius R2, uh, top radius of R1, and a side length of L. And we want to know the surface area of this. Now I'm just going to write down what the surface area is, and then we'll uh, go through the process of actually verifying that these are the surface areas. So what is the surface area of a cylinder? Well, the surface area of the cylinder is 2 pi r l. What about the cone? Cone turns out to have surface area pi r l. So it's half the area of the corresponding cylinder. And what about the frustum of a cone? Well, it turns out to have surface area pi r1 plus r2 times l. Now, I, I, I could put a box around this, but I like to think about it this way. I like to think about this surface area as 2 pi times r1 plus r2 over 2 times l. Now, why do I like to think about it like this? You may say, well, okay, that just looks a lot more complicated than the original formula because you added this extra factor of 2 in. Well, sort of. If I write it like this, then I can think of that as being r bar, the average of r1 and r2, r1 plus r2 over 2. So I can think of it as being the average of the upper and the lower radii. So I can think about the surface area of a cone as being 2 pi times the average r bar is r1 plus r2 over 2. Now, what that means is if I think about it this way, then all of the ones above are special cases. If I think about the cone, the upper circle has radius 0, the bottom one has radius r. What's the average? The average would be r plus 0 over 2. So I could write this as 2 pi r over 2 times l, which is really just 2 pi r bar l. So it's this surface area for a cone is a special case of the surface area for the frustum of a cone. What about the cylinder? Well, the cylinder is has surface area 2 pi times, what is r? r is the radius of the base circle, but I could also think of it in the way of, it's the average of the radius of the upper circle and the lower circle. The average of r and r is just r. So it's nice to think about the frustum of a cone having a surface area of this. Now, okay, of course, by no means have I proven any of these things. I just discussed what the formulas are we're trying to show and their connections with each other. Now let's go ahead and show that each of these formulas is valid. What do I do for the cylinder? 
I'm actually going to do the same thing in all, um, pretty much all these cases. For the cylinder, I slice. I cut and unfold. Okay, what do I mean by this? Well, imagine you've got a tin can, like a food can, and you've got a label wrapped around it. If you slice right down the label and unfold it, what shape is that? When you unfold it, it's a rectangle. So we get a rectangle. What's the height? The height's still L. What's the base of the rectangle? Well, that's the circumference of the circle. So that's 2 pi r. So what's the surface area? The surface area, or the area of this resulting object in this case, is 2 pi r l. That's exactly what we wrote down for the surface area over here. Okay, so that was that cut and unfold. We can do the same thing here. Cut and unfold. Now it may take a bit to think about this, but I'm going to draw a picture. Maybe think about it in reverse. Okay, so I've got a circle. And let's cut a wedge out of it. And I take this piece and this piece and glue them together, and what do I get? I get a cone. So this cut, doing that process in reverse, cutting a cone and unfolding it gets you a shape that looks like this. Now, of course, the angle between these two uh, side portions is really has to do with the proportions of how tall it is versus the base radius. But the point is, is that we get some sort of circular wedge, whether it's this sort of larger portion of the circular wedge. That would be something that's a really short cone but really wide radius. Or whether we get um, a really narrow sort of uh, wedge, and that would be from a really tall cone with a really small base radius. But the point is, is that the general shape is we've got some wedge of a circle that we've used to construct the cone. This is now a flat object. I can work out its area rather easily. What is its area? Well, its area really depends on this angle here. What is that angle? Let's call it theta. We need to know what the angle theta is. What things do we know in this picture? Well, I know that when I slice that side length, the L, when I slice, that's exactly what these two side lengths are now. So that's L. So that I'm thinking of a circle here, a circular disk of radius L. What is the arc length around the circle? Well, that would have been the circumference of the base of the original cone. So the arc length is the circumference of the original cone, the base of the original cone, so that's 2 pi r. Okay, but what else is arc length? Well, arc length is also the interior angle here times L. So this is also L theta. Now that tells me what theta has to be. So that means that theta has to be 2 pi r by L. So that's theta. Theta is 2 pi r by L. Now that I know that angle, I know the area. So what is the area? Well, the area is just what portion of a circle am I staring at, or what portion of the interior of a circle am I staring at? Well, if this angle was 2 pi, then it would be the whole circle. So this is really telling me, in some sense, what portion of the circle is, what fraction is. So the area, maybe I'll say area is equal to the fraction of the circle, the full circular disk that I'm staring at, times the area of a circle. The area of a circle is pi l squared. The portion of the circle that I'm looking at is 2 pi r over l divided by 2 pi. The angle, the interior angle for the wedge I'm staring at, divided by the angle in a full rotation. So this is r over l times that, or in other words, pi r l. And that's our area, pi r l. That's exactly what I wrote down here. Surface area is pi r l. So we've done our cylinder. We verified the surface area of our cone. What about the frustum of a cone? Well, here I can think of this as being the difference of two cones. So the surface area is the large cone. Now for the large cone, I'm going to have to introduce a quantity, which I'll call L1, which is that side length of the top. What's the large cone? Well, 
the surface area of any cone is pi times the radius times the side length. So it's pi times the radius. The large cone has a ra base radius r2, side length l plus l1, minus the top cone, that portion that was cut off. So that would be pi r1 times l1. Or in other words, it's pi r2l plus r2l1 minus r1l1. Now the question is, right now this is dependent on l1, but I don't want it to be dependent on l1. I want a formula that's independent, like this thing over here. I want it to just be based on r, the two radii and the side length l. So how can I rewrite this in terms of just r1, r2, and l? The key is to note that we have similar triangles in this diagram. If I look at this diagram, and draw a vertical line here, I see some triangles in it. What are the triangles? Well, there's an R2, an R1, an L1, and an L. And so by similar triangles, I have that the proportions of the small triangle, L1 over R1, is equal to the same proportions in the large triangle, L1 plus L over R2. And so now we get that R2 L1 is equal to R1 L1 plus R1 L. Putting everything involving L1 to one side of the equation, we get R2 L1 minus R1 L1 is equal to R1 L. And that's exactly what I need because it says R2 L1 minus R1 L1, that's that thing there, can be replaced with R1 L1. So this can be written as R2 L plus R1 L. Or in other words, pi times R2 plus R1 L. And that's exactly what I wanted to show. So we use this expression, similar triangles, to make that reduction. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. That was our surface area. But of course, as I mentioned before, the way you really want to think about this, and the way we're going to be using it, is to think about the surface area of an object like this as 2 pi times the average radius times the side length. 2 pi times the average radius times the side length. All right. Okay, so those were the formulas that I wanted to derive for you because we're going to be using them in coming up with our integral representation for the surface areas of general surfaces of revolution.